Greetings. Patrick here, Eight Questions With, and we're back. That's right. Um, wow. Uh, had a great show today. Uh, had a great day so far. Our, our first uh, show was today. Uh, we went out to, to, to the United Arab Emirates, to the city of Dubai, to talk to um, a fashion model and actress, uh, Pooja Piku. And uh, had a great had a great interview. Um, the interview is up, and it's uh, on my on my channel. You can check that out. And uh, tonight we're back. We're back with the end of the double header. As as you can notice uh, by the banner there, the, by the scroll, just when you thought it was safe to to, to uh, you know come out and do an interview, the Cinema Squad returns to take over. And uh, tonight we're, we will be talking to Jonathan Martinez, also known as Man of Movies. And uh, he is a, a respected and esteemed member of the Mighty Cinema Squad, uh, which is a group of six friends who uh, it's a, a collective, so to speak. And they get together and they talk films um, and uh, and they cover everything. They just don't cover this one genre. They cover dramas they cover musicals horror uh superheroes uh star wars star trek um uh a24 isc uh midnight you you name it isc films you name it they'll cover it and um very very cool people very very uh some of my very favorites so this is a real honor to be able to continue this series and talk to uh jonathan uh, actually, I do believe Jonathan was the first member of the Cinema Squad that I actually met, and uh, and him and I subscribed to each other's channels. Uh, hi, Drew. Hi, Nanette. Hi, Jimmy. Um, I had a, I had a, I have to I can't ignore him, Nanette. I can't ignore him. I don't want him coming over to haunting me. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm really uh, I'm really glad that you guys are here today for this for this interview. We're going to talk about a lot of things uh, tonight because. There's a lot to talk about. Um, not only is Jonathan a, a respected uh, a voice when it comes to reviewing movies, discussing movies, uh, but he also likes as part of the squad. And uh, but he's also uh, uh, he's also newlywed and a new father. And that's actually uh, that's that's something we'll be talking about because um, uh, uh, I actually wanted to interview Jonathan sooner. But he had a, he has this young uh, a young daughter, and um, I didn't want to you know put him in a position where he would have to you know get up or leave or anything like that. I wanted to give the, his little baby a chance to grow up a little bit. So if he did something like this, that it wouldn't be interrupted. Because I don't know if he uh, does other interviews. I don't know. Actually, that's a good question to ask him. That's the Cinema Squad starting to get some notoriety because they really should. They earn, they have earned it. Um, they also got to meet face to face. Four out of the six members got to meet face to face down in Florida, right before Hurricane Ian. And uh, you can see we can see pictures of them having a lot of fun. And they even did a review together. Uh, together, all four of the four of the uh, Cinema Squad uh, got together to review. Uh, Don't worry, darling. Uh, which actually, to tell you the truth. I was actually curious about that movie, but the more I hear about it, the more it just seems to crack like it's a car crash. Um, hey, Betty, how are you? Uh, and there's Eric Thorpe reviews is in the house as well. Glad you're here to, to help support Jonathan and uh, and support the channel. I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you. Um, so they gave their they gave their uh, they they talked about the movie. They took a deep dive into a well a miniature dive, I would say. I don't think you can go deep in 30 minutes, but they did. Um, sounds just like interesting movie, but one that, based on what I'm seeing from them, it's one maybe uh, I'll wait for the library to deliver. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully they'll the, hopefully they'll drop a uh, "Don't worry, darling" at the library. Um, so uh, while we wait for Jonathan, he'll be here shortly. Uh, uh, as you notice above you, there's uh, there is a uh, poll we put out there. Um, uh, like if there was a brawl going on, who would win between the Avengers and the Cinema Squad? And let's check that out because I, that's a close fight, actually. You guys don't even, don't even know. Uh, so far, so far the Cinema Squad would be kicking ass. 
I'm I'm with you. I, I'm I'm with you. My, I, if I had a vote to cast, I would definitely vote her for the Cinema Squad as well. Um, uh, that's that's so that's awesome. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I should tell you a little bit more about what's going on, on the channel because that's what I do, right? That's what I do. Um, again, thank you to all the guests this week. We've had an outstanding week uh, here on the channel. Uh, we interviewed uh, Joseph uh, Dam Damiamo. Uh, he was awesome. Uh, we, we got to interview Yvette Willett yesterday. Uh, absolutely a, a sensational interview. Uh, Highly encourage you both to go, everybody in the chat, to go back and check both those interviews out. Uh, two very, very creative artists. Our interview with uh, with uh, Pooja is up. You can check that out. Very cool interview as well. And then uh, what a way to end the week uh, with Jonathan. So, uh, yeah, this has been another strong week. But that means one thing. That means, you know, if you had a strong week this week, what are you going to be doing next week? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'll tell you. Um, so starting our, our week off on October 9th on the Midnight Society, uh, uh, we will be welcoming in uh, John Grande. Me and John Grande from Grande's Graveyard, we are going to tear it up this Sunday. Uh, we are going to be bringing you five hidden gems that you guys should be talking about or should watch. Uh, these are movies that, that either are have been forgotten or have yet to be discovered and we think that you should uh so we'll be talking about that we talked a little bit of general horror too uh i'm sure that uh i'm sure that that will be uh that'll be on the menu as well we'll be talking about uh terrifier 2 which is coming out tonight and also we'll, we'll be playing in the theaters by the time that me and john talk um we also have Halloween ends. We'll be talking about that because that'll be coming out next by next Sunday. It'll be out. Uh, it'll be out by the 16th of October. It'll all be out. So uh, we'll be talking about that as well. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be really, it's going to be a good, it's going to be a good show Sunday. It's our first time to collaborate with John and I'm looking forward to it very much. Uh, and then on the 11th of October, we welcome in artist. Uh, photographer, writer, uh, extraordinary talent. Uh, Maureen Doughty will be here with us at 8 p.m. Uh, we'll be talking uh, art and process and, uh, you know, what makes art, why is art so, um, why is art the most subjective uh, medium I think I know out there? Um, nobody looks at art the same way twice, and it, it'll be really interesting to talk to her about that. And uh, so she'll be here on the 11th at 8 p.m. Uh, then on the 12th, we have the Bud Files will be here. Uh, the Bud family from uh, from the Dakotas will be here, and they'll be talking to us about uh, uh, exploring uh, exploring the Badlands of North and South Dakota, and also doing uh, some paranormal investigations, and just being a great family that, that goes around and, and and has a lot of fun together. Uh, as you can see, there's the cheetah. Uh, he knows he knows the cinema squad's coming. Yes, that's right. Doesn't doesn't it does his tail look like a dorsal fin or what? Uh, it does, dude. You look like a damn shark. Hey, look who's in the house. It's Ricky. All right, right. Uh, Ricky is uh the old AF reviewers. Uh, it's got a new job. So I hopefully once he gets used to the weight, hopefully we'll see him and Pablo back in action. Uh, as you know, that they are the craziest channel on the tube, uh, for sure. <laughs> Crazy. Um, then on the thirteenth, we had a schedule change. Um, uh, our original guest uh, Wes uh, was not able to make it. He's going to go see Halloween. Halloween ends. So uh, we asked our good friend Michael, uh, aka the owner of the best channel name ever, uh, Heroic Waffles, to come back on the show, and he agreed to it. So we will be talking about uh, Black Friday. Uh, that's right. Uh, Black Friday is just around the corner, uh, and there's a new Criterion sale will be happening in November. All the boutique labels will be dropping new items. Uh, so if you're into collecting movies, and uh, if you're into collecting movies and finding the best deals, um, 
besides Ken at Mid Level Media and uh, Master Chaos, uh, I I, th- I dare say that uh, Waffles is probably the third most authority. You know, the best person I would talk to to uh, find that where I get good deals at. Uh, and I know because he's got me some good deals. Um, I just need a I just need a Blu-ray player to to play it. Uh, so that'll be happening on the 13th. And then on the 16th, I should mention, I'll do one more week real quick. Uh, on the 16th, we have uh, our conclusion of our John Wick trilogy. Uh, I will be joined by Betty J. Gathers and guess who? The Cinema Squad. <laughs> That's right. Anthony from Fever Dreamland Theater will be joining us and uh, to talk about John Wick 3. I did tell you that the Cinema Squad is taking over, so I wasn't lying to you. Um, so they'll be here on the 16th at eight o'clock here on this channel. And we will be talking all things John Wick as we wrap up the third movie and anticipation of the fourth movie, which is coming out in March of 2023. Um, all right. Uh, on the 18th of October, we have Ken and Ashley, uh, from Sledgehammer Horror. They'll, it'll be their first time to come in and answer eight questions. Um, sensational channel really sweet people and not that far away from me now if i can just get my old reclusive ass up and down to ann arbor uh we're gonna have coffee soon uh then we have director michael lacastri on the 19th of october we'll, uh, we'll be talking to him he's a rising film director and uh he's got a new movie out uh we'll be talking to him about that and and this process and um and why is comedy harder to direct than, than drama? That we'll be asking him those questions. And then on the 20th, we have uh, shock rocker Constance Steele. Um, she is a, a rock and roll a rock and roll musician, and she also does, uh, in her in her words, erotic uh, uh, erotic uh, horror thrillers. So that'll be interesting as well. I have never met a neurotic horror actress as of yet. So that'll be cool to talk to her about that. I have talked to a couple of people about playing guitar in, in band. So I think I got that covered. Uh, and then um, uh, I just added this interview today. And this will be a complete departure from our channel. Um, in fact, I can I already know some of you guys, how you guys are, are going to react. But you know what? I'll talk to anybody, and this is proof of this. Um, we will be welcoming in author Ted Ted Jordan will be here with us on the 25th, and he is a conservative Christian author. He, he has written a book called uh, The Restore, and uh, we will be talking to Ted about his book and uh, about our country, and that will be at 8 o'clock on Tuesday, the 25th. Now put your hands together. Uh, our good friend Jonathan is here, so let me go get him. Uh, what is up, Patrick? What's going on with you, Jonathan? Oh, man, I'm just chilling, having some coffee, trying to wake up, you know, but I'm ready, Patrick. I'm excited. Me too. Me too. And I was ready because, as you can see on the scroll down there, I was ready for you. <laughs> yeah, we're taking over, man. We're taking Take- over. I know. You know what's funny? It's like, okay, here we are. We're taking over today. You're taking over tonight. Okay, I got I got five out of the six squad members done, and then I turn around on this Sunday, and all of a sudden here comes Anthony coming back over to take over. You guys are gonna what cover the third John Wick movie? Is it? Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. man. I, I'm excited. Um, but that's you know nice. that's one that's one of the things I mentioned about the Cinema Squad, which is one of the huge reasons why I love watching you guys so much, is that you cover everything. I I. I that's how I feel when I when I do my films. I like to cover everything. Yeah, I think I think that's such an important thing, especially if you want to consider yourself um, like film a film critic or a film lover, whatever you want to put it as. I think to be able to enjoy every single genre is is so important because then you know if you don't have a bias. Oh, you know, sometimes, oh, he's just saying that because he likes superhero movies. So, of course, he's going to like every superhero movie. Or he's just saying that because he likes horror movies. So, of course, he's going to like every horror movie. But if you like everything, you never know what's going to be coming out of our mouth. Yeah, because, I mean, yeah, I mean, there are a few. 
I mean, there's and here, especially here on the tube, there are a lot of what I call slappies. It's just maybe sort of sort of a derogatory term, but that's just what I call them. What is and those that? Are the, a slappy is one that just follows everything, likes everything, goes wrong with you know, like you know, they're just gonna. They, or, or sometimes they can even, you know, they're just like any, like you said, any horror movie comes out. Oh, it's the awesome. It's the best. And, you know, it's just like, it's okay, you know, it's okay to have a differing opinion and a formed opinion. And then you got the, then you got the hardhead who likes to draw attention to themselves by disliking everything that everybody else likes. They, they want to be that one little stick in the, in the, in the water that saying, I don't, I don't like it. Uh, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, just to cause controversy for the sake of causing controversy. Right, right. And you know who those you can spot those people coming, you know, 10 miles down the road. Um, yeah. You know. yeah. And it, well, yeah. if you if you had a if you had to choose one side of the spectrum, though, Patrick, what would you choose be, to be too positive or to be too negative? Um, I'd rather be too positive. I mean, if I had to do, I, I, I don't want to be negative on everything. I am I am negative on movies. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to pull my punch. Uh, I do like, I do, when I look for, when I watch a movie, I do try very hard to look for a silver lining in every movie. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know if you know this director, but some of the people in the chat probably will, but there's a, there's a director, and his name is Dustin Ferguson. And that guy can make, he, you give him $10, He's going to make 10 movies. Wow. So uh, I didn't say they're good. They're just absolutely horrible. <laughs> but, but like I'm watching this one movie called Blood Claws. It's a running joke. The movie is absolutely horrifyingly bad. I mean, seriously. I, I see. I could see a kid in, in kindergarten finger painting better than this guy can direct the movie. <laughs> but once in a blue moon, like in Blood Claws, he 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 put and it had nothing to do to do with the movie, but he put a musical interlude in it. He showed a band playing. The band was really really good. <laughs> it was like <laughs> oh, this, this is this this movie sucks, but this band is kick ass. And, Four uh, out of five. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the sequel? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, everybody's coming in. Uh, everybody's coming into the chat. I see Sean's here. Um, uh, He's mentioning positivity. Positivity is the way to go, but it's also important to be critical. That pretty much explains how I review uh, IFC and and A twenty four films. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that conversation you guys had a, co a couple of weeks back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 well, you know what though, Sean dropped a hell of a, a hell of a review for Vesper. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know what it was. My ears, all of a sudden, my hear, I hear my ears started burning. I'm going like, somebody's talking IFC. And I dashed on over there, Sean kicking down a review, and I'm going like, "Hell yeah, look at my boy go!" <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> he's coming, he's coming over to the dark side because we got cookies. You, uh, yeah, you sure do love your IFC Midnight, though, Patrick. Man, I, you know what? It's a uh, yeah, but we all have our favorites, don't we? Yeah, absolutely, I mean, absolutely. I think that's important. Uh, what 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 uh, what's what's yours? What's your uh, what what's I mean when you hear someone dropping a movie, what studio or, or or a company is your favorite? I I actually have their logo tattooed on my calf, and that is the Pixar logo. I I adore Pixar. I I've been a fan of Pixar since before I could even remember. I love Pixar. My favorite film of all time is is Toy Story. Believe it or not, I believe um, it. Yeah, so so it's always been Pixar. Now, not to say that Pixar hasn't had their ups and downs, and I think lately they've had their downs. Um, yeah. But but I am still excited every time they announce a new project. I think it's because I think Pixar, and you know, this is just my opinion, but I think Pixar has has actually gone down because of the Disney Disney's interference. You know, Disney being involved in it when they were a standalone company, they could do no wrong. I, I, I agree with that. I, I've had some conversation with, with friends of mine about that, talking about how I think Disney's interfering in Pixar as of late more than usual. Because Disney's always been involved with them since the beginning. Like, they've always had the distribution right, and they've always had their logo on their movies. And they had some say, some wiggle room in there. But lately, Patrick, I think it's to another extreme. Yeah, you know, it, it just really seems like um, 
it, it seems like more and more and you know studios better better adjust themselves quick because i think now more and more studios are pumping out some of these movies and and i think part of it is that they're they're thinking about the foreign market you know like a lot of movies come out if you take away their china business they crash and burn yeah they crash and burn they're not considered hits uh-huh uh, yeah. and uh let's see um uh, and ricky's saying that uh disney's Id ideologies have poured into into pixar wow do you think that's fair or do you think pixar's uh, ideologies has poured into disney uh, you know what? I, it might be a little bit of both because if you if you want to look at some of Disney's films, not Pixar related, uh, lately people have been saying how they've been feeling more like Pixar. But it's funny how that's the description that they're feeling more like Pixar. It's not that they're feeling more like Disney; they're feeling more like Pixar. So I do think that there's probably some Pixar going into Disney, but uh, I I think more than than most, I would agree with Ricky in saying that Disney's ideologies have poured over into Pixar. Um, I, I don't, you know, it's, it, 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 movies are, uh, it's sort of weird how, how they're being, um, you know, more and more. I mean, first of all, we have to talk about the one statement, you know, the one, the one, the one word that everybody misuses a lot and uh, that's woke. Everybody said that's, they're woke and they're saying it like, they're saying it like it's a bad thing. And it's just like, what? Well, well, how is it a bad thing? For one thing, um, all all woke means is just awareness. It's like, or better yet, how about fair play? You know, um, and think about it, you know, it, it's funny. It's you know, look at that movie Bros, right? So that's the the new film that Billy Eisner, I think, put or put out, right? I, yeah, Billy Eichner. Billy Eichner put out. Now they released it last week, and it just crashed and burned. Um, but it's, what's sad about that is, is how much of the, uh, uh, the gay community has supported mainstream cinema, you know, poured millions into their other money into making the supporting mainstream cinema. Uh, a lot of them work to make those movies to come out to the mainstream. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's no secret. There's a, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, a gay men and women that are holding, you know, uh, uh, uh positions in studios. And some of their decisions are making movies for us to watch. Now, um, all they really want is just to have a chance to go and watch themselves on screen. Um, you know, they want to go out there and say, hey, it's okay. You know, we, we've supported you for, for, for generations. Come out and see what we're doing, you know, on the big screen, you know, to give, you know, come out and, and see what our lifestyle is about, what our, what, you know, what it's like, you know, us communicating with each other. It's no different from watching a romantic comedy. Absolutely. Um, but yet, yet America just burned the heels on it for the most part. Is, is it, a, is it more of a, was the movie not very good or was it more just more America just not wanting to be open minded? I, I don't think that it's not about the movie not being good because I think, if anything, Bros has been getting good reviews. I haven't seen it yet. I'm still planning on, but it's been getting good reviews. I think more than it being um, about a the, the gay community, I, I think it's more saying about rom-coms because it's still a rom-com um, mm -hmm. just within the LGBT community. And I had read an article, I think it was like a week or two ago, that a couple movies that were slated for theatrical releases are now being slated for streaming releases because the rom-com genre is slowly dissipating. And I it couldn't is. believe that. Yeah, so they were talking about bros in that, for example, and how they're not expecting bros to have a good turnout, uh, theatrically speaking. And it's not, again... It's not that it's about LGBT characters, but it's more about the rom-com genre just slowly dying, people not wanting to see it in theaters, I should say. And it's finding a new life and a new popularity in streaming. And I think it's true, because uh, I don't remember the last time I saw a rom-com in the movie theater, but I, I could probably tell my wife, she's probably seen five rom-coms in the last couple of days on Netflix. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think the only other place I know where they have romantic comedies coming out, I mean, and not at the theater per se, but just coming out in general, um, is, is like companies like GAC or Lifetime or Hallmark, 
you know, those are the only places where you can actually see those movies. And you're right, we're not seeing them in the mainstream anymore. Um, now, you know, every 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 uh, uh, genre has a cycle. I mean, you know, like it, right now, we're not seeing anything right now. But who's to say, like, and you know, all it takes is just one monster hit. You know, someone rolls out and, and gets a hundred million dollar box office off a of five million dollar investment, and next thing you know, you're going to see a lot more of, the, of that genre. Um, that's just how Hollywood is. They they grab something that's successful and they run with it, sometimes to death. Um, yeah. Eric says, Anthony, I think Bros was the definition of an average movie, but that's, that's how I am with comedies usually. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, and then, uh, oh, in superhero movie. Uh, did you hear about the rumor about Harrison Ford uh, possibly being General Ross in the MCU? I, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't want it either. I wouldn't want it either. No. Uh, let's see. We need to do breakfast at Tiffany's. Yes, I would do that with you, Betty. I would do that with you for sure. Hey, Phil. Greetings. Greetings. Yeah, breakfast at Tiffany's is a is, is a classic, absolutely. Um, with Audrey Hepburn and George Papard and and uh, Kat. Um, so well, let's go back to the year beginning because we got to do this. Uh, sure. But, but where were you born and raised in? R raised at? Sorry. No, yeah, you're good. You're good. I was born in Puerto Rico, so I'm I'm a Puerto Rican native. Yeah, I was I was born in Ponce, Puerto Rico, 1996, and I lived there. For, for a few years, um, and then after that, we ended up moving to Florida, and that's where I'm at now, and I've been here my whole life. So I was definitely raised in Florida, but I did spend a, a couple of my first years uh, in Puerto Rico. So I know fluent Spanish, and that was my first language. English is my second. Uh, you still, you still, are you still bilingual now? I mean, you still speak yeah. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah I still do. Yeah, I got family members that only speak Spanish, so I got to speak to them. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Um, my uh, my mother, uh, my biological mother, she she married a Mexican American, and um, he would speak Spanish uh, with his family too. His his uh, his mama, it's all she spoke was Spanish. So oh, really? every time, we, yeah, he, he sometimes he would sit there and say, "I have to go home." Because I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting some of the words. I, you know, I, I you know, some of the, I'm not speaking enough uh, Spanish, so I have to go back home so I can read, so I can test it up on it. <laughs> uh, it, it happens, believe it or not, it happens. You stay away oh, no. from one or the other, actually, one or the other, and you start forgetting. Uh, so were movies always a big part of your life when you grew, when you were growing up, or you know, or or, or, or sports or other ac activities? Uh, you know, Florida being such a great, you know, great place for fishing and beaches and all that. Oh, Were yeah. you an outdoor kid or indoor kid? I, I was I was since I was born in 1996. I was in that weird era where I kind of considered myself a 90s kid. Uh, but I was also I also grew up within the, the 2000s. Uh, so I did go out a lot because phones weren't really as popular as they are, are now. I didn't grow up with a cell phone. Uh, my first cell phone, I think, was eighth grade. Uh, so I was always outside with my friends. And if I wasn't outside with my friends, then, yeah, I'd, I'd be in my room. And I, at an early age, I always had a, a vast imagination. I, I always liked to create things. Uh, scenarios is what I mean. I used to have a lot of toys growing up and I used to love uh, just creating these scenarios in my head where it was like a movie. I was making a movie with my toys. So, that's, yeah. That's, do you think we lost, do you think kids today have lost that? Um, uh, yep. that cause I don't think, cause I don't think playing games is very creative. I don't, I think making them is creative, but I don't think playing them is creative. I don't, yeah. and I don't think it helps develop imagination like books do. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I think if playing a game could could give you that ambition to go out and create a game, I think that's awesome. But I think most of the time kids just get stuck on the screen and not with the idea that comes behind the screen. And I think even with movies, for example, it's one thing to sit in front of a, a screen and watch a movie and not do anything. Right. And it's another thing to be on YouTube or be a filmmaker and do something about that passion of yours that you have. I think it even goes for movies, not even video games. Uh, just, just being stuck in that one narrow 
lane could be dangerous. You have to explore. You have to go out and do something with that passion of yours that you have, whether it's video games, whether it's movies or whatever it may be. I, I agree with that. I, I wholeheartedly do. I, you know, to get out there, it's it's a catch twenty two sometimes though, because you know you see a lot of times you'll hear parents will sit there and say, you know, I'm afraid to let my kid go outside because of the uh, activities outside, and then they're stuck indoors. And it's like, well, you know, they can't go outside and be a kid. They can't go outside and shoot hoops or or play football or nothing because you just never know. You never know. You know. You know. You, your your son could be playing with a stranger and then have a uh, have a miscommunication and then you know it's it's you know my it's 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 you know like I, I i live in a subdivision and i look i can look outside the window from my office and even during the summer it's rare for me to actually see kids out at all you know i see sometimes i'll see them right by their bikes but i never hear them play you know in the window you have the window up you hear them screaming up and down the up the, down the road you know you know, shoot, yeah. you know, shoot the ball or throw me the ball. You don't hear that anymore. You hear a lot of kids sitting there playing video games, but you don't really see it outside. I, it makes you sort of wonder where's our next generation kind of come from of creative of creative artists. Yeah. Do you do you think that that maybe the parents are also a problem, Patrick, in the sense that they're sheltering too much because of how scared they may be of of today's world? I, I I can't blame them though. I mean, here here yeah, here, yeah. you know, it used to be the only thing you used to worry about sending your kid off to school was did they finish their homework? You know, mm. did you pack what they want for their lunch? You know, did I mean, did they forget their jacket at at school because you know clothes don't grow on money? Now in today's society, you know, you just don't know. You don't know if you're sending off your kid for the for the last time or not because you don't know what could happen at the school. And what that's a horrible place to be. I know. It's a horrible yeah. place to be. I mean, I, I, I admire you. I admire you. I mean, I, I do, you know, it takes a lot of courage to bring a child into this world now. I mean, it really does. Um yeah. it's you know, because and and you know, and, and the, like you mentioned about the romantic comedies fading away, you know, and like right now everybody's celebrating the Renaissance in horror films. It's like Okay, that's cool and everything else like that, but I don't think a renaissance should be at the expense of of another creative, you know, ar ar artistic genre. I don't think it should come at a cost. Like, you know, um, like the you know, superhero movies come out and they take over the whole theater. Um, you know, last year, last year they had a uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino was uh, was talking and he's in there going like he was trying to get a, his movie on a couple of screens. Well, he went down to, to uh, uh, New York, uh, you know, Central, uh, you know, what is that, a park? No, it's not. Gosh. Times Square? Times Square? Times Square, yes. And they had they had all the theaters there. They had 70 screens full of Doctor Strange. Jesus. That's all Jesus. they saw. That's all, he had no choice. He had no, there was no freedom and there was no choice to see something different, something, uh, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, creatively different. It was stifled. Yeah. Um, what, that's a shame. It it is definitely. Um, well, so what what movies in in uh, art you know filmmakers? I mean, what got you into becoming a uh, a movie buff, a cinephile, so to speak, uh, yeah, yeah. a reviewer? What got what got you uh, going in that direction? Um, there's a couple movies that have made a lot of impacts with me. I I mentioned Toy Story being my favorite film. That was the earliest film I, re I remember ever seeing, and and I watched that multiple times a year. And I just love that film. Made me fall in love with 3D animation, animation in general, that art of filmmaking. Um, believe it or not, I've always liked film. But the moment that I knew that film is a passion that I want to take somewhere, whether that be a filmmaker or a reviewer or whatnot, it was when I first saw A Nightmare on Elm Street. I believe I was in like seventh or eighth grade when I first saw Nightmare on Elm Street. And I adored it. I loved it. And it wasn't until I saw, I think it was a, one of the documentaries that come, came with the DVD or, or Blu-ray. And I was Craven and a lot of the cast and crew just talking about their experience making the film, the ideas behind the film. And that kind of opened my mind. And I remember going, wait, 
you this is this is something very creative it's not a pastime it's not just for entertainment this is a lot more than meets the eye. You can go deeper with this and you can expand your mind and be creative and impact other people and, and change your worldview and change the worldview of others just through your creativity on screen. That's that's crazy. I, I want to do something like that. And it was all thanks to the Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, uh, S O F R I T O. Are we back? Ta -da. We're back. Um, What's up? Uh, did you? Uh, uh, Ricky asked you a question of old AF reviewers. He said, uh, "It says, ask John where's my soft, a soft Frito recipes." <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! Okay, okay. Uh, what's, what's the soft? I, what's, the, what's the soft Frito? I got you, Ricky. I got you. Uh, uh, so, well, so Frito is is a, a lot of Hispanics use it in their food. Uh, it's like a this green mixture. It's like cilantro and and a whole bunch of like these different things put together, and it, it makes like a good base for maybe your rice or your beans. And and a lot of Hispanics use it in their cooking for everything. And so Ricky always teases me about it. And I told him I got you with a recipe. You know, he'll end up, he'll end up using it too. I believe it. I hope yeah, so. He, he, he's not, he's fearless. Uh, let's see. Uh, Katie's here. Uh, Sean's taking off to work. Uh, thank you for coming out, Sean, and supporting. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Uh, everybody saying goodbye to Sean. Let's see. Um, and Ricky also has something to say too. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Drew said this. Um, that's okay. The reviews for it are great, and people are saying the guys who played Jack, who plays Jack Russell, did a great job. Uh, I don't know which movie that is. Um, um, what is that one? Just Jack Russell. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I think he, maybe he's talking about Werewolf by Night. Is that new Marvel special oh, that's yeah, coming that's out tomorrow? Right. Yes, yes, that's right. Jack Russell. Yep. Yeah. Uh, are you? Are you, I know that. Uh, I know when I talk to Jace, like I know that he's big into superheroes. Uh, what about you? Are you big into superheroes too? I mean, is that a popular, a popular thing for you to watch, or is it one of those that just happens to be out there? I used to be really big into superheroes. I used to be very big into superheroes and then um, Marvel's phase four happened and I just slowly, slowly just started not liking their material. And I'm not as big as of a superhero fan. Now we started this uh, stream saying that we're into all the genres and believe it, I still am. I'm into every single genre, including superhero films, but I'll be lying to you if I said I was the biggest fan of, as Chase, cause I'm, I'm not. I'm really not, and I don't really look forward to superhero movies like that anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny. Um, it, I mean, I, 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 you know, I don't know if it's not it's, if it's the superhero movies or it's the people following them that really sour me on. <laughs> I get that. I get that. I, I really, you know, it's like I, I see them. I see them. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of fans come out of the woodwork. They're superhero fans, but they've never read a super. Uh, they've never read a book in their life. You know, and, you know, it's like the director of the Eternals saying, well, they gave me a stack of books to read. OK, uh -huh. so you're going to go ahead and read out that little stack of books that they, they gave you and you're going to go make a movie about it, iconic, iconic characters. Yeah, that's, that's like getting that's like getting the cheat sheet to the life of Jesus and going out there making the, the uh, uh, you know, a, a, a story about God, you know, a story about Jesus. I, I got the pamphlet right here. I can go ahead and do that. Yeah, it's like the spark notes we i used to do that in, in high school spark notes i just wouldn't right. read the chapter and i'd go to sparknotes.com and just get a little synopsis on what the chapter was about <laughs> yeah exactly exactly i can do this i can make this uh, yeah i can go ahead and, and, and yeah uh it is it is um i just think i think i think they've oversaturated the market 
100%. I think that's my biggest issue with it as well. I don't even think it's uh, the superhero fans per se, though I can give some credit to the fact that some of them are, are unbearable. But yeah. I think it's more how they're saturating the market and what they're saturating the market with is is, is not as good as it used to be. Yeah, I heard that. Uh, I, I, I watched Jace's uh, uh, She-Hulk and um, man, that's just that's been the worst thing that they've ever put out yeah dude it's 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 such a nut it's such a nothing show i lose 30 minutes of my week every time i watch that show and i it's like i'm expecting it to get better but uh, this was episode believe it or not it was it was pretty good but other than that yeah it's like a nothing show i'm i'm so i'm like done with marvel until they really start to understand where they're going to be going from here and and they start showing that in their in their material with quality because it's quantity over quality right now yeah they i mean it's in one hand it's very cool to see them bring out characters like she hawk or, or werewolf by night you know it's very cool to do that i'm, I'm hoping i am hoping against hope uh uh you know when they were going to do the armor wars series I was hoping against hope that they would bring out Stingray, and you know, because that's one of my favorite characters. And then they, um, okay, for Armor Wars, I was like, okay, if they if they bring out Stingray, I'm just gonna fanboy out. Um, but now they're gonna make a movie, so I think his chances of appearing in it are pretty slim. But um, yeah. I do like the fact the idea they are bringing out set some secondary characters. That's something that DC has been so been unable to do. Uh, there's only yeah. been one time where they've been able to do that uh, up, up before Black Adam, and that was uh, uh, Justice League Unlimited, the animation. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Hobbs is sitting there going, uh, people can enjoy movies without needing about reading the books. Uh, not everyone reads and doesn't make them any less inferior than the people who read. Who read. Uh Sure, they can. They they can, but you got those same people, Hobbs, that are going out and watching the movies without reading the books. That are coming out, you know, and thinking that they know the characters and they know the movies and they know. And it's like it's not really the same. It's, it's you know, and it's you know. I know that the fan base. Well, the fan base is what got you there. It got you a seat at the table. Without the fan base, where are you? You know. Um, it's the same thing with Star Trek and Star Wars. If the fan base hadn't kept both those franchises alive through their through the novels and through conventions and through and what have you, you wouldn't you wouldn't see any of those movies being you know carried forward. Um, and and I, I personally I personally am one of those. I'm a stickler for that. It's like imagine imagine making Freddy. Imagine making uh, um, well take your favorite horror movie. You know imagine taking uh, uh, Freddy Krueger. And um, making them a making them a pastor or something, you know, taking them out of a, out of hell, and we're gonna make we're gonna put Freddie in and in a, in a, make him a pastor, roving around the wild, roving around the uh, the, the countryside, and uh, killing everybody. It's not the Freddie. It's not. It's not. It's not the Nightmare on Elm Street that we know. And I think I think there's a lot to say when it comes to uh, adaptations, whether that's book to movie or vice versa. Uh, I'm a big believer in giving merit to separate art forms. So while we could look at a book and give merit where it's due, how that book fleshes out its characters or its scenes, uh, when it comes to a film, I believe the same thing. I, I believe it's more about the execution and not really where the source material is coming from, though, though I do believe it's important. But yeah. in the end, I, I I do think it's all about how you execute said story. So you, you for example, you mentioned uh, Freddy Krueger was a pastor. It's it's ridiculous on paper, but what if you got a really good director to to direct a movie about Freddy Krueger being a pastor and it ends up being a bomb ass movie? <laughs> well, what about all those diehards that would turn around and com com complain about it? That's never going to change. Yeah, it's like you got to make peace with all, that. Yeah, you got all those people who you know. Who love Friday the third, you know, Friday the thirteenth or Halloween? I tell you what, we're gonna make Michael Myers. We're gonna have Lori Strode, us, uh, you know, we're gonna have her switch powers with them or switch bodies with them. That's gonna be our new Friday. That's gonna be a new Halloween uh, story. 
Now, Lori, Lori's going to be Michael. And Michael's going to be Lori. That's awesome. It, oh my God! What happened? You, you, it would implode. <laughs> it, it, isn't that what happened in like uh, in Rob Zombie's Halloween Two at the end of Rob Zombie's Halloween Two? I don't know. I never saw. That. So is that what he did? Good, did he have them good. switch? Did he have them switch uh, stuff? That would be weird. At but the very know, yeah, like at the very end of Rob Zombie's Halloween Two. A uh, spoiler alert for a movie that's like fifteen years old now. Uh, I think like the Lori character is in a psych ward and it ends with like her, like looking into the camera, like all evil. And it's like, Oh, now she's Michael. Oh God. Yeah. They, they tried to do that with Friday the 13th too. Oh. And it, it didn't work. The fans were going like, Oh hell no. Don't she, you know, cause they're going to make Tommy Jarvis into the next Jason. And all the fans just said, no, 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 we're good. <laughs> 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 um, uh, uh, Let's see, uh, ask Patrick if he read the book for Hereditary before he watched it. <laughs> oh, uh, my God. Uh, A24, they've been coming out with uh, screenplays for their films, and they make them into, like, hardcover books. Yeah, I saw that. I, I think they've done that for Midsummer, and I, I know for that. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if they did it for anything else, but I know they did that for Midsummer. Yeah, Hereditary uh, that, is one of them. Is it? Is it a... <sighs> Why? Yeah, it's a script, though. It's just a script in a book oh. form. Um, what's been the most disappointing film that you've seen in the last five years? I mean, the one film that you were so hyped up for, and then you watched it, and you're going like, what the hell happened? Oh, okay. After, uh, after, hered after Hereditary. <laughs> I, I, I heard your discussion about Hereditary. I know how you feel about it. I don't feel that way at all. I love that movie. <laughs> But it, a movie that I felt that way about, dude, I am a big Star Wars guy. I adore the Star Wars franchise, and I understand they're not all good, and there's a lot of crap in that franchise, but I love the world, and I just can't get out of it because I love it so much. So imagine me after getting out of the movie theater for Rise of Skywalker. Oh, oh man. No, that wasn't for me. See, that's what I was talking about. That's exactly the same thing I was talking about. When you go to see a an MC, MCU movie, and you're thinking, because you know, because see, uh, uh, Star Wars had, you know, you know, between the 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 between the series, you know, the the writers kept that going. You know, the the the, you know, every their Star Wars books out. I really sorely, I I completely believe that without those books, there's no Star Wars today. But mm. they kept it alive. I mean, everybody will go to Barnes and Noble or, or Borders and buy the new Star Wars book. And they're selling them hardback. So you had diehard people spending millions of dollars into it. And they created their own, their own world. And then Disney took over Star Wars and said, all that work has been wiped out. It's no longer canon. Can you imagine? I, I just, it blows my mind. It's just yeah. like, how could you just, just simply out of hand Say everything that we just done, that you've done for the, the past fifteen years is all gone. Luke, yeah. Luke, you know, uh, Han and Han and Leia never got. You know, they they kept that aspect of it, but Luke, you know, Luke was supposed to be a, a teacher, and you know, he and he was a lot more of a vibrant character. Um, yeah, it, just, hmm. it, it 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 was a, a, a yeah, it was a, it was a it was a bummer. It was it was a big bummer. I, I am a little more optimistic when it comes to Star Wars on the small screen, because I think the creators on the small screen, they're actually starting to bring back elements of those books that are no longer canon. And making them canon now. Yeah, I think they had to. I think they I think they got the blowback. I mean, because think about this. Here you go. It's been years since the, pre since the prequels, and then you come back and you say we're gonna we're gonna do another trilogy of Star Wars, and you just basically remade a New Hope. You switched the sexes around, but you basically made a New Hope. Yeah, I I, I don't hate Disney Star Wars like everybody else does, but like I I I like the Force Awakens, and I agree that it is just a New Hope, but it's still good. It, it's still a New Hope. But it's still good. And and so I, I really enjoy that one. Um, believe it or not, I like Last Jedi more than most people. But there is a lot in Last Jedi that I don't like. 
and I get that. But I, I guess what I like with Last Jedi is the direction that they were trying to take the franchise in was was fresh and new, and I was anticipating it. And then Rise of Skywalker came and just crapped on my face. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. Yeah, you're you're preaching, you're preaching because um, I tell people the one the one MCU movie uh, that I really just can't stand is. Um, I can't stand the, the Guardians of the Galaxies. Those two movies, I just can't stand them. Just can't. <laughs> the Upside Dan may have an issue with that. Oh my gosh! It's just it was just such a car crash. They, <laughs> they, they, they took Yondu out of, out of, out of time and space and put him in the in the, with a new team. Uh, the ending of, the Star, of Galaxy of Guardians Two, where they had Sylvester Stallone being Starhawk with a with a leftover members only jacket with some sort of wire on it. Saying let's go, let's go steal some shit. It, 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 he just wanted to grab James Gunn and just like, I, let's let the cheetah have him for five minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I can understand you want to change some stories, you know, because you know, like origin stories are the hardest stories to tell for any franchise, a horror franchise, a drama franchise, like James Bond or something like that. Uh, do you feel that's that is the hardest that is the hardest movie to make when you do a franchise? Do you think? It's the very first film. Yeah, I, I think it's especially if it's been done before. Like think of the Batman, for example, how they do it. They try to do it every single time and it can become repetitive and unnecessary after a while. And also when it comes to an origin story, you just want to get to the point where they become the person that you know them as and not them growing up. And that can be boring sometimes, whether that's a superhero film, a James Bond film, like, for example, Uncharted came out this year. And people want to get to where they're at. And an origin movie is them building up to that. Sometimes, sometimes people don't want those building blocks. They just want to get there. Yeah. I mean, people have to understand how, how it works a little bit better. A lot of a lot of the casual fans, they don't understand that when a, when a movie studio has to make a movie. You know, they have to cater both to the fans, you know, the people who are, you know, in a sense, sort of responsible for it. But they also are trying to get an audience, you know, so they have to go out there because, sure, you and I know who Luke Skywalker is. But what about the couple that's next door to us or the family that walks in that's never this is their first time seeing Star Wars and they don't know anything that's going on? You have to cater to those people. You have to let them, you know, you have to give them time. So it's like, this is what really happened. Well, we already know what happened. Yeah, but they don't. Yeah. And guess what? There's a lot more of those than there are you. Yeah. So we are going to do that. We're going to take our time. We're going to, you know, put an origin story out there and introduce the world. Um, let's see. I am really uh, ignoring my chat tonight. I, I'm really, <laughs> this is what happens when you get really fired up. Uh, <laughs> the, the view with Drew. Uh, do you think Guardians of the Galaxy is the worst MCU movie? Or, you do, or do I think there's worse? Um. And that's to you, right? I, I, I have yet to see a, a I have yet to see a star. I mean, I was unhappy with uh, 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 Avengers Endgame. I, I didn't really? really. No, I didn't like that at all. Wow. Um, no, I, I. I tell people if you want to see how Avengers Endgame should have been, go watch uh, Justice League Dark Apocalypse War. Then come talk. That's <laughs> how it should have been. That's how. Oh, it's been. Wow. Yeah. Ooh. Hot Lord. take. How, uh, that is a uh, that that movie will. Uh, yeah, that movie will leave some tears in your eyes as well too. And it's an animated movie. Uh. So yeah, there's. Uh, I mean, but I just uh, Guardians is just per, is personally my my uh is my you know the, the specter on me because I grew up with the team. There's some of my favorite characters from the first team. Uh, I think they're tremendous characters, and you know I know I'm in the vast minority, but still, you know I, I still like from the least like if you're going to try to get it, at least attempt to get it right. You know, don't make them seem like a a, a, a space pirate in a in a members only jacket. I mean, you know they deserve a little bit more respect than that. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Gizmo mentions I find review people I find review people now uh, nowadays not trustworthy uh is it is it it is all controlled by the marked by the uh probably but yeah i would say that um uh by the big money by the studios 
yeah, that's why you got Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, um, and then uh, I also find them too young. Uh, find them too young. Uh, wow, that's. Ooh, how old were you when you did your first? Uh, when you reviewed your first movie? On YouTube. In general. Did you did you write before you uh, started doing YouTube? Were you like a blogger before you started YouTube? Or I used to, I, I used to write uh, reviews on my Facebook. Um, but then, like, I, I was catering to an audience that did not care <laughs> about movies as much as I did. So that's why I, w- I went on YouTube. But, I mean, I'm 25 right now. So, I don't know, 23 maybe? Okay. 22? Um, I mean, do you do, do you watch pretty much movies within five five years of them being released? Or, or are you comfortable going back and reviewing films from the 60s, 70s, 80s? Oh, if if I have the chance, I, I, I watch any any movie I, I can get my hands on. But my biggest thing is, yeah, I, I watch movies as they release uh, is my biggest thing. So I, I've got a nice back catalog of films I've seen just within the years. But, yeah, of course, I, I, I know movies from back in the day, per se. Um, I see Eric's mentioning, uh, he says, I'm more of a DC guy. Uh, but even I wouldn't say Justice League Dark Apocalypse is anywhere near as good as Endgame. Oh, I just I would I would disagree with that. I think I think yeah. Now I like Infinity War, the first part I liked that a lot. Okay. Uh, uh, I I really did. I but the end but the Endgame was just a bloated, hot, you know, just it was just too bloated. And I mean, and and there should have been a, the, the the final fight should have been a little bit longer. Um, you know, I wish that could have been. They, they I mean, they should have focused more. I mean, I love the fact that in the final fight, they focused on certain characters. Like when all the women squared off together, that was badass. And I was totally down with that. But it needed more moments like that. And it, it just didn't deliver it. Uh, but I did like Infinity War. Um, let's see. Uh, Jace is here. All right. He, he's probably happy we're talking uh, uh <laughs> He's probably t- he's happy that uh, uh, that we're talking MCU. Uh, let's see, uh, let's see, uh, let's see what else here. Uh, the Affinity War is better, and Endgame is bloated, but I think it's exactly what it needed to be. Yeah, I, I just you know that's what happens. You know, like uh, you know, for Star Wars, you know, like we didn't expect to see Luke being played like a punk. You know, you know, like a coward, which really just angered a lot of fans. You know, he. You, you have some expectations when you watch a franchise of how a character should act. Um, is it is it too much for you know? Is it do, do you think studios play too much to to fans these days? They call it fan servicing, mm-hmm. where they try to put an Easter egg or a reference to some other thing that the fans might know about. Do you think studios do that way too much in catering to the audience? So so yes, I do. I- but I don't think fan service is a bad thing. I think fan service can be a good thing. And of course, a fun thing for the fans watching that TV show or movie. Here's my issue with fan service, though. Studios have been doing fan service way too much. That if a show or franchise that is known for its world, known for its lore, every movie or every episode doesn't have some sort of Easter egg or cameo for of a character that we know then people just brush off that movie or people just brush off that specific episode because it's not full of Easter eggs when it's not, it doesn't matter if it's full of Easter eggs or not. How how was that specific film? Like I said before, I'm all about merit. You got to give, you got to judge it for its own merit. Yeah, sure. Like maybe I, I like Easter eggs. I, I fanboy out sometimes, but, but you got to judge it for its own merit. You can't always just want Easter eggs in every single one of your episodes. Yeah, I agree with that. I when, I when I started reading about fan service, I was like, wow. I mean, I don't, I don't want them to catering that way. I want them to tell a good story. I want the story to be original. Like every movie, every Marvel movie that comes out, you know, I don't I don't expect to see Samuel Dell Jackson in every movie. Yeah, I don't want, I don't necessarily need to see that. I mean, if it's if it's if it's, if it's organic, if it fits the story, awesome. But just to have them stuffed in there just because. No, you don't want that. It it takes away from the story and the and and uh, basically it it robs. You know, it just it feels forced, and you know it does. Yeah, um, yeah. Star um, Wars is is a big culprit of doing that. You, it's a galaxy, a galaxy, and yet 
people are always crossing <laughs> paths yeah. like like if it's just like a, a town of 300 people <laughs> yeah right right yes i mean tattooing who ever expect a little a planet like that would be so full of intrigue I know a whole galaxy full of planets and and, and systems, and yet everybody's always in tattooing. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, a question for a uh, question for John. Uh, um, did you guys hear the rumor about Harrison Ford possibly being General Ross at the MCU? Mm -hmm. Do you? Wow, because you know, because uh, 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 William Hurt passed away a few months ago. Yeah, uh, tremendous loss too. By the way. Yeah. Uh, um, just an amazing. That's. I love that hair. I loved uh, William Hurt. I thought he was a great actor. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, what do you think about Harrison Ford? Did you see the previews for the new Indiana Jones movie? Not yet, but I heard they're they, they're leaked, right? Yeah, someone leaked it on, on the tube. I haven't seen it. It, it, it looks, uh, you know, it's hard to get excited for it, to be honest with you. Really? It, How come? Yeah, it's really hard because... You know he's 82 years old and it's like you know it's like you know it's gonna be all cgi i know yeah you they're know. gonna de-age him i think i think it has to do with time travel <sighs> yeah yeah so, so steven spielberg's not directing this movie i take it no but the director of this movie is the director of logan and uh, ford v ferrari so he does have some some good films under his belt but if there's some george there's george lucas all over that um, cause I was watching the crystal kingdom of the crystal skull mm. and I was listening to the commentary about that. And George Lucas wanted to put aliens in that movie and George Spielberg talked them off the ledge saying, yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> um, yeah. So <laughs> this one has uh if that's what they're doing, time yeah. travel, I'm, I'm yeah. taking it that, uh, I'm taking it, you know, and you know, that's the one thing about, uh, uh, a movie like that it's like it's rooted in reality you know it's like okay these things could happen even though they're venturesome but they could happen but i think when you introduce that sort of element into it uh, it's it's like why not just take in the damn space i i think i think it's based on on even like if not reality a sort of earthly reality because there's a lot of like biblical artifacts in indiana jones and how uh, like he, they open the box and like the spirits and they ravage through all these Nazis and kill them. And, and how in the third one, when they, when they take that leap of faith and they're walking across the, there's a lot of supernatural elements within Indiana Jones, but it's yeah. not ridiculous. It's not out there type stuff. It's, it's like, Oh, like this is coming from the Bible or some sort of lore or that some cultural cultural lore. And then you get to King of the crystal skull and they're like, Oh yeah. Aliens. Just, just yeah. aliens. And wait, but that's not of this world like the other films have proven to be. And now this one has to do with time travel. <laughs> you, you've lost ideas? Yeah, that's it. I mean, like I said, why not just put them on a rocket and shoot them into space, you know? That's <laughs> next. Moonraker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but as far as uh, Harrison Ford playing uh, 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 Thunderbolt Ross... I, I don't know. I you know what? I, I mean, I don't. I don't know. I mean, you know, as long as they had him sitting behind a desk and answering the phone, I guess he'd be he'd be all right. I kind of, I kind of, uh, I want. I, I would like for it to be canon that General Ross also passed away. You know that? Yeah, yeah. I don't think they should have him replace the character. I think they should have him create his own character. Yeah, yeah. I think I think so too, Patrick. And plus. He, he's supposed he's the namesake for the team the thunderbolts and you know how that's going to be a marvel movie in the next coming years and you don't really need general ross there you could just say that general ross passed away and in honor of general ross we're going to name this team the thunderbolts yeah I, I i'm with you about that it's funny too we're here we're talking about uh william hurt and uh and totally unrelated totally unrelated believe me uh i didn't i didn't plan this but we're talking about William Hurt, and um, I just wanted to show this to you. So uh, this is a movie called Hellgate, and uh, it stars William Hurt in it. No. And, uh, yeah, and if you really got a good look at this, uh, maybe you can't over here, but uh, over here, um, as you can see, that uh, William Hurt did an IFC film. So um, I see. <laughs> now, now, how's that? For, how, how's that for a perfect segue? 
Thank is you that so is that your favorite William Hurt movie then? No, no, no. But I, I will I will say this, I, I, and we're going to talk independent films here. Sure. Um, y- you know, if you think about it, um, you know, we're talking about all the big the big heavy hitters. You know, the the massive movies that are with the huge crazy ass budgets. Um, but no, Hellgate was the ISC of Midnight film. Has Carrie Elway's in it from from the Saw franchise. Yeah. Um. Uh. God. Please. You know, Hoff. You know what? That. Yeah. You're right. I can't. I can't say differently. That was a hor- That was a terrible movie. I mean, in 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 respect. Yeah. <laughs> um. But uh, uh, I got that movie and I saw that William Hurt was in it with Carrie Elway's. And I'm going like, wow, you know, William Hurt did an ISC Midnight re- movie. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, he must have phoned it in. You know, he must have just been there because there's no money there. You know, it's a low budget movie. And, um, but wow, hell no. It's a great movie. Oh, wow. And he, yeah, he take he, he plays it straight. He, he plays it all the way through. It's a, it's a really good performance, re- outstanding performance. It is one of my favorite uh, of his that he's done. Uh, okay. I've seen him, you know, I've seen him in a lot of heavy hitting movies, but uh, but I think toward the end of his career, you know, I think he sort of relaxed a little bit. Like he didn't need to be cast in every single prestigious movie that was coming out. Yeah, he was know? okay playing the side player. Right, he was okay doing, uh, you know, playing the Thunderbolt Ross. You know, I mean, he really didn't have a whole bunch to do in, in the series, but you know, there he is. People love this character; they loved him playing it, and so why not? You know, have fun with it. Yeah. And um, uh, okay. Now I'm I'm getting heat from the pie wacket. Um, was uh Pat pointing out a A24 logo? Oh no, no, it's not A24. Uh, no, I'm not promoting A24 today. Uh, no. Uh, though I do have uh, I do have you? Did you see the stack of A24 films I have? No, I haven't. You guys, yeah. All right, I guess. Well, I'm, that'd be sort of like pandering, I guess. But uh, if you guys, if you guys like to see the list of the A24 films I have, just say yes in the chat, and I'll show it to you. But only if Hop shows us his Wild Eye movie. Um, <laughs> that's that's fair, right? Oh, there, there's Dan at the heart. He's throwing out a heart for A24. Um, have, have a, let's talk about a little bit about A24 and ISC. Sure. And boutique labels. I mean, we're talking independent film. When did you discover independent film? I mean, because you know, when you and I grow, you know, grew up, and we're pretty much we're, we're, we're the same. That we always went to saw the latest blockbuster. Yeah. Uh, but you, but you got to see independent film probably about the same time I did. About 25, I discovered independent films. Um, oh yeah, I was, I was a lot younger. Yeah, I, like my twenties is when I started taking my passion somewhere, whether it's writing or or YouTubing. But man, I was in my teens when I was, uh, like watching independent films. I, I remember, I don't remember which production company did this movie. I don't know if it's an independent film. I don't think it is, but it's definitely not a blockbuster. I was, I think, a sophomore or a junior in high school. And I remember just wanting to go see Joaquin Phoenix's Her. Do you know that one? Her? Uh, yes, that's the Scarlett. Jo- uh, no, the phone. Uh, yeah. Was, Scarlett Johansson is the voice of the, the AI in the phone. Right. And, and I wanted to see it so bad because I thought there was something there that, that a lot of blockbusters were missing. And I bought a ticket that weekend to see Hunger Games Catching Fire because I was too young to buy a ticket for her because it's rated R. So I bought a ticket for Hunger Games and I just snuck in to go see her. And I loved it. I loved her. And I would say that was when I was, I said, I need to see more movies like her because these blockbusters, like they're fun in moderation, but you need to go out there and expand your mind a little and, and see what else you you could watch. Yes. I I love it. I, I do. I, I love that. Uh yeah. The first the first independent film that I went and saw that I can remember was a movie that uh it was called Miracle Mile by directed mm. by D, D, D Jeanette. Okay. Oh my stars. Man, the first time I went and saw, I went and saw that movie, there's like the, it was a really small theater, art house theater. Okay. There's like there's like sixty seats, they're all full. And uh, we watched Miracle Mile, 
And um, at the end of the movie, you know how they already, already stands up and puts on their coats and they're chattering and whatnot, talking and whatnot. Jonathan, that theater was absolutely silent. Wow. Nobody, nobody said nothing. Nobody. Impact. And they all got their coats on and they just walked out. And then they all of a sudden, then they broke off in the groups and they started talking with it, talking about the movie. Complete strangers. I, I got, I got, we, you know, we, I was talking to like four or five people. I didn't know who they were, but here we are. We stood around for a half hour talking about what we, what we just saw. And after wow. that, I just fell in love with independent film. It's uh, amazing, I, right? What, what I, I like to say, like, that's, that's artistic filmmaking, independent yeah. filmmaking. I, I've had a sort of similar experience to that as well. Have you seen Darren Aronofsky's Mother? Yes, love it. I love it too. I remember when I went to go see that with my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, we went to go see it. And, and it was the same reaction where nobody got off their seat and they, the whole credits went by. And everyone was still in their seat. And it was like, what? What? I love it. I love that experience and feeling when watching a movie. Uh, I, I did too. Uh, Gizmo's pointing out something right here. He's mentioning, uh, why do people call A24 independent films? That's a good question. Uh, half of them are produced by studios and 30% are produced by European film uh, marked again uh, by, uh, that's again, that's marked that again is, okay, I don't know the last one, but he's right. I mean, he's right. Yeah, you uh, know. Oh, okay, here it is. Uh, he goes, I'm sorry, uh, it says by Mark, it's again, Mark owned by leaders of the studios. I don't understand that. True independent films are movies that are made outside the system. <laughs> and he's a film director. He directed many films. No, he, he, I, I'm, I'm, he yeah, has I'm, a point. I'm, I'm, yeah. No, he definitely has a point. I, I think I think it's more the feel and vibe that an A24 movie gives out is that of an independent film per se. I kind of like the way that AMC theaters market films like A24 or an independent film. They don't market as an A24 independent film. They just market under the banner artisan filmmaking. Yeah. And I kind of see it like that. You know, it's really funny. Here, here's something that's really ironic too, right? You just mentioned AMC. So here's AMC and they're marketing A24 films. You know, they showing them in their, in their theaters. What's really funny is that ISC Films is owned by a uh, AMC. Really? Yeah, they also own Shutter. Oh no! <laughs> I actually don't have Shutter, but I just I've heard too many people talk crap about it. Isn't it? Isn't it's it's the most ironic thing. It's like that is okay, ironic. like uh, ISC has a uh, they have a uh, a little theater in New York. And, uh, you know, and that's where a lot of the movies get released. If you look at ISC films, you look at their box office, they're always pennies compared to uh, like A24 now. Uh, even now, you A24 is not making all that much money, but they're getting there. Um, it depends the move of the movie. Yeah. Um, but but it's really weird. It's like here here, here you are. You're, you're, you have a theater chain. You own a theater chain. You could at least put some of these movies in on your screen. You know some of the Shutter movies or some of the uh, 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 IFC films or whatnot, and yet you rarely ever see them on a, on an AMC screen. Mm -hmm. It's all about money, Patrick. That's why, for better or worse, it's because they're putting what's going on the screen is what's going to make them the most money. Yeah, um, and right now it's Star Wars and Disney. I mean, yeah. I personally think yeah. Disney's way too strong. I, I don't really like. I mean, every all the studios are being consolidated. And yeah. you know, it really, it you know, now they're talking about the new thing they're talking about is uh, about maybe having uh, Comcast Universal uh, basically, you know, work with uh, Paramount. They're starting. They're talking about uh, doing another, um, uh, you know, a conjoining. And I just think that just takes away the more they conjoin, the less choice we have. Yeah, I I don't know if it was Paramount. Maybe it is Paramount. But I also heard that the reason that. Uh, Discovery bought Warner Media is because they were thinking about selling to Universal. Wow! Not, yeah, that's been it's a whole. Crazy. That's been a whole. That's been a whole uh, a, a car crash too. Dude, uh, competition is good, and I don't know why people don't agree. 
like it's cool like like when when oh disney's buying fox and discovery's buying warner and maybe universal's buying warner now and like that's that's cool on paper but then you got to think about it like competition is healthy yeah i mean you know if you if you uh control everything and don't have any don't have any uh uh outside you know don't have any competition then you you grow you grow stagnant you grow yeah. there's no challengers and there's no creative challenges we can do whatever we want and no one's going to you know no one's going to say anything cuz we do everything but you know it leads to just a, a, a inferior product uh and like you said i mean now marvel comes out i mean it's it's so huge now that when they come out there's nothing special about it yeah it's just like well werewolf by night's coming out tonight and it is it is i didn't, I didn't even know yeah, I think it's coming out uh, today or tomorrow. And it's like it is. Yeah, okay, oh you know there's there's no anticipation, um, and they keep slamming it down our throats. It's like you know what? I would like to see a musical. I would like to see a romantic comedy. I would like to see you guys put out some more variety. You know, that's what I want to see. I want to go. I want to be able to go to a, a local theater and see Vesper. I won't be able to see Vesper here. I won't be able to go there. And it won't be. It won't play on my screens. I'll, I'll get I'll get uh, I'll get Wakanda forever, but I won't get Vesper. Yeah. Um. Yep. Let's, uh, let's see. Uh, you know what? Let's see. Let me see. Uh, let's see. Heartbreak feels good in a place like AMC. <laughs> oh my god. What's What's that mean? Uh, I'm guessing it's been a while since you've been to an AMC theater, Patrick. No, I haven't been in a long time. Yeah, so so now every single AMC theater for about two years now, right before the movie starts, they have this minute-long short of Nicole Kidman walking into an AMC theater and narrating the experience of going to the movies. Oh, there's nothing like when the lights dim and heartbreak feels good in a place like this. And it's it's been parodied to death. Oh no, I have never. I haven't seen. It. I haven't been to the last time I actually been to a theater was to see it part two. Ooh, yeah, twenty nineteen, right? Yeah, last time I seen the movie at a theater. Wow. Everything else, I, I, yeah, yeah. I might go out tomorrow though. Okay, I, I, I'm very much interested in seeing Smile. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, I think Smile. I saw the previews for that, and, and, and to me, it had a sort of a. a when I first saw it, it sort of had the uh, It Follows vibe to it. It definitely I, does. Everybody, everybody, everybody else was saying that too. But you know, yeah. that's, a good, that's a good thing for me. That's I not love, a bad thing. I, no, I think It Follows is one of the most original horror films I've seen in the last 15 years. Com completely agree. Oh, uh, you, you, I, I think you'll like Smile. It looks creepy. Yeah, I saw it on Sunday. Uh, have, you ever, have, you, uh, have you ever watched a movie that has creeped you out so much that you've left? You ever walked out of a movie that's just got underneath your skin? No, I never actually walked out of a movie, but I've seen people walk out of a movie because they got under their skin. It was Midsommar. When I saw Midsommar in 2019, I, I didn't I didn't walk out. I stayed through the whole thing. Uh -huh. But I there was a, an older couple, an older couple who were who who was a, in the auditorium with with the crowd. And have you seen Midsommar, Patrick? No. Okay. No, I, 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 I'm afraid to because I don't want to fall asleep during the day and lose yeah. my day. <laughs> well, it, it's very gruesome. And there is a gruesome scene that takes place over a cliff during a ritual. And it's very graphic. And I, I think this older couple didn't know what movie they were getting into. They might, It might have just been a date night for them. And so when this scene takes place and the whole theater is gasping and they walk out, they hold hands, and they walk out of the theater, they wait a second, they look at the screen, more gruesome shit is happening, and then they just walk out and never come back. <laughs> <laughs> my sister, my sister, uh, my sister Christine walked out of the lighthouse. She said because she, she said it was she said it sucked. <laughs> really? So she, yeah, she said a blue it's, chow. My, almost, other, my other sister loved it, but my uh, my younger sister hated it. Yeah, the, the lighthouse is slowly be it's slowly getting cult status. There's another movie that I recommended that if along the same lines, it's sort of really it's sort of a little bit maybe a little bit different. Uh, it was called Cold Skin, by uh, produced by Xavier Jens. That movie right there, I now that's a brilliant movie, brilliant movie. Yeah, 
no one knows about it. Nobody. I mean, what movie? What movie? Um, like you know, with me, uh, as you probably notice in the background of our chat. Did, did, did you see the picture? The, the background picture. Yeah. Do you know where the movie that came from? I. I mean, I want to say Lord of the Rings, but I'm not sure. Mm. -mm. Uh, that's from a, a dark song, which is uh, my favorite film. And oh. uh, yeah, that was also an IFC mo IFC Midnight movie. But okay. what 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 hidden gem? If you were gonna champion it, you know the Cinema Squad all got together for like a hidden gem. What mm -hmm. what hidden gem? What what movie would you bring out and and champion? The Florida Project. Have you have you ever seen the Florida Project by Sean Baker? <laughs> I I have it. I know. Really, really, you're gonna do another A24 on me. That's so. That's so funny. <laughs> it's funny. Like I, I don't even, I don't even mean to to bring up a twenty four. Believe it or not, I, I, I it, it's more Sean Baker than it is a twenty four. Like a twenty four is in the background, the back of my mind, uh, in the front of my mind is just Sean Baker. I think Sean Baker is a, a brilliant artist. You know, you got me though. I tell you one thing. You, you're, because uh, the Cinema Squad. Let's talk about the Squad for a minute. Yeah. Um, because you guys do a lot of independent films. You guys talk a lot of independent films. Yes, you guys do talk superheroes and you do talk, you know, mainstream movies and whatnot. Um, you know, an Oscar, like you had the rubber duckies, the Oscar, you know, the Oscar contest you guys talk, you, you guys do. Um, but overall, I, I think, I think you guys are really strong in independence. I, and I, and I really like that a lot. Um, you know, you guys don't just do all the big mainstream movies. Um, and like I really enjoyed the review you guys did. Uh, 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 don't worry, darling. Um, yeah. Every, every everybody was hype child, and then once you see it, and you were like, "Yeah, I'm not really sure what I'm hyping up," you know, because <laughs> it's not a very good movie. Yeah, it's it's really not that good of a movie. I think I I think if you haven't seen it, I, I I'm curious for people to see it. So for the discussion's sake, but it's not too good of a movie, no. Yeah, it reminded me too much a little bit of a. Uh, it reminded me a little bit too much of the Truman Show, uh, you know, a bad that's a better you know, movie. I, Truman yeah. Show. Uh, you know that sort of that sort of theme sort of remind me of that. Uh, let's see the chat here. I'm really far behind here. <laughs> um, let's see. Casey says his local AMC has eight theaters, and half of them are Marvel. Every time a new one releases, that's yeah, sad. that's that's the problem. That's a My big problem. My AMC has 24 theaters. I have a Megaplex. And no independent movies are shown. No, yeah, they are, believe it or not. Yeah, that's Ooh. why I love I love my AMC because they have blockbusters and the independents in there. Good for it's them. 20, it's 24 screens. The, yeah. Man, I'm really far behind here. Hold on, let me let me uh, let me try to catch up here. Of course, of uh, course. Gizmo says, but that make that that makes a wrong a look at films like that, and as part of destroying the industry, when everybody calls it a, an independent films. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that A twenty four is no longer a uh, independent film company. I do think they are mainstream now. Uh, I do think that their movies are coming out. I mean, and the funny thing about it is, though, their movies are going to be underneath the pressure. Of, of mainstream movies too, you know, as far as a box office go, uh, like everybody talks about X and Pearl, mm. but but uh, the Black Phone destroyed uh, X box office, and um, and and Smile just absolutely, you know, ruled the box office over uh, over Ma uh, over Pearl. Um, I think they're critical darlings, is what I would call those two movies, but I would not call them necessarily. You know, they they made their money back. You know, for the investment. You know, Ty West did what about a million five for the two movies, and it's made about thirteen million back, fourteen million dollars back. That's a good return. Yeah. It's a good return, but it's not it's not like earth shattering by any stretch of the imagination. There's been several horror films that have come out there, and the same thing. I mean, you look at Black Phone. Okay, we we'll, we made that for what twenty million dollars, but it made one hundred and fifty. Yeah, it made one hundred and fifty. So I mean, there you go. Um, yeah, I also know, like, for the general public, at least in my circle, I know people that haven't even heard of X or Pearl. They they're like, "What? What's that?" But when I mention Black Phone, they're like, "Oh, I haven't seen it, but yeah, I know about Black Phone." It, it wasn't Black Phone Universal. Uh, I believe it was. Yeah, yeah, big studio. I, I I saw X. Um, 
I'm I really want to I'd like to see Pearl. Yeah, uh, I saw, I've seen both. I've seen both. Uh, I, I I thought X was I thought X was a solid film. Yeah, it was solid, but it was it was it didn't rewrite the book, you know. And and that's the thing. Everybody thought it was like the it was going to be rewriting the book. And I think a lot of times people when they get into that, I think that they get taken away by hype. Uh, uh, the the hype machine can really make a movie a lot better than what it really is. Dangerous. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, especially when you go to like a award season, and and we get yeah. and we get forced uh, Francis McDormand down our throat for the fifth time. I, in the world. I love Francis McDormand, and I love award season. <laughs> yeah, like he didn't deserve it for Nomadland. I agree. She did not for Nomadland. H- Haley Bennett should have got it. Ah. Uh, uh, yeah, she should have got it for a swallow. Um, that's a that's a, <laughs> that's a that's a mind that's a mind blower. Uh, an independent film was marked at films that got the money from channels privately. Uh, I, mean, I think Mark when you say marked, it financed uh, privately financed in other places uh, back in the seventies. So they always got props. Yeah, you know, I, you know, independent films. Wow, God, just to be able to fight to get a budget. You know, that's the first thing that you know the. That's the first thing about a movie is get, that you acquire more than anything else is a budget. Mm-hmm. Um, wow! And yeah, you, know, you know, do you know what a you know what a small budget movie is? You know what the budget of a, of a, a micro budget is? Nowadays, no. What is it? You, you know, you're gonna lose your shit. So a micro budget movie is considered between zero to ten million dollars. Ten million dollars. Yeah, I got some. Uh, let me look in between my couch couch cushions right now. I might find ten million dollars. Yeah, that's a wow. micro. That's a micro budget. So I, 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 you know, I heard that. Cause I've heard it from other directors. Yeah, that's what a micro budget is: zero to ten million dollars. That blows my mind. It yeah. blows my mind. It's like, wait a minute, how's ten million dollars or five million dollars? Oh hell, even a million dollars. How's that a micro budget? But that's what it's called. Hmm. Uh, let's see, let's see during see uh, Gizmo still he God we gotta get him on here. Uh, see during the nineties, New York had a bunch of independent films produced that we all call cowboy filmmaking. Today they say this about every film. Uh, yeah, I don't. I'm with you. I don't think every movie is made by the skin of their teeth anymore. I think a lot of these movies, and especially you know some of these, some of these, uh, even these boutiques, they will produce in-house they'll produce their own movies in-house um let's see uh you know uh you know what it has a lot of anticipation every week from people house of the dragon yeah but that's like a 200 mil uh, was it no uh was it the, the, the lord of the Rings series i think it, it was a uh, 500 million dollars for them to make yeah. that yeah i think the lord of the Rings series is the highest budgeted or high yeah highest budgeted show ever yeah, most isn't expensive it? show. Uh, what what is your feeling about streaming? Do you are you a fan of it, or are you uh, are you a, are you an advocate of it, or, or are you um, are you are strictly big screen first? Oh, when it comes to film, I'm a big screen guy. I, I'm the theater experience is where I go to die. I'm going to go to die in a movie theater. That is my second home. I adore the movie theater experience, but I'm not going to be that person to just hate on streaming. It's the way of the future, whether we like it or not, it's what's going to take over. You know, I don't mind so much that I, I I tell you what I do mind, and I don't sure about the cinema squad. I like to see what you guys uh, say about that, but uh, about physical media. I mean, do you think that it hurts to me? I just feel like the studios are sort of like cutting their, their hand off. Um, yes, they have streaming, and they do. They have a lot of people sub, sub to the streaming, but the, the majority of us do not stream, that are not streaming, and that will not stream. Um, but we can't, like, we can't get any. Uh, we can't watch any of the movies that are coming out uh, for the most part uh, because they're not really, they're not releasing them for home market. Do you think that's a mistake? I think in our current climate. It's a mistake if you just put all your money into physical media because it's there's no money there. And I love physical media. I, I have a collection of films that, and it keeps growing. I love physical media. I've always had physical media. I have so many VHS 
tapes that my mom used to used to show me and i had so many of them so it's always been a part of my life i still collect them they're important to me they're significant to me but they're not money makers and so in the end is it a mistake i i in my personal opinion i i want more but in the end if they make more physical media they're just gonna lose money because everything's on streaming now I just, I mean, you know, I just feel for a company like, I feel like, uh, uh, oh, uh, oh, Eric asked me what's what's kept me from the theater, you know, it, it just, I just don't have the desire to go. I just, I don't like assigned seating. I'll tell you that right now. That's probably the number one reason why I do not go to two theaters anymore is because I do not, I like, I do not like uh, assigned seating. I, if I get there early enough to watch a movie. I want to be able to walk up there and pick a seat out that I want to sit in. Not because somebody's sitting at home and they're and they're buying a, a seat. It's like, you know, the first come, first serve, you know, uh, there's something exciting about that. You get there and you get there and you watch the theater fill up and you see people looking for the right seats. You know, the, you want to sit here? No, this little, it, it's, it's, it's part of the experience. Then going over there and and and, and then, then you run the risk. Uh, me and my buddy, we, we had this happen to us three times. We would go to a, to a theater, and the theater would be so small because they put all those luxury uh, chairs in. Uh. And then you then you go to buy your uh, then you go ahead and, and get your assigned seating, and they only have single seats, so one's in the back and one's in the front. This is like oh yeah yeah yeah. It's like you know, I came all the way down here to watch this movie. I could go buy my ticket, walk in there, go in there, and sit down, but because you sell the the, the seats. Now, now that's taken away. So that's that's a that's a big reason right there, uh, Eric. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, House of the Dragon. Let's see, every time we see that, my girlfriend reminds me she's the one that tried to kidnap Paddington. Uh, who who tried to kidnap Paddington? His girlfriend, apparently. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. <laughs> I love yeah. Paddington. Uh, Mother had a thirty million dollar budget. That is three times the budget of the biggest film ever made in Scandinavia. Independent? Hell no. No, I agree with that. I don't. I don't think that was a. I definitely think it was an art house film, and I and I think it was. I think it was. Uh, uh, I think it was going to lose money anyway. I do. I don't think it was. There. I think some movies are made knowing that they're going to lose money. Yeah, uh, I think. I think know. so too. But, I think. But, you do, uh, they do it to keep the director in house, you know, to make him happy in case there's something down the line, you know, to do pet projects. Um, I, I sometimes, but yeah, isn't that something? Thirty million dollars is three times the size of the biggest film ever made in Scandinavia, and they make some great films in Scandinavia too. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Question for you and John: uh, Which comic book movie would you rather watch again, Daredevil two thousand three or Ghost Rider, both directed by Mark Steven Johnson? That's an excellent question, Drew. I'll let John answer that first. Um, jeez, maybe Ghost Rider. Maybe Ghost Rider. I'm. You know what? I'm actually going to go with Daredevil. I, I really enjoyed the director's cut of Daredevil. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I thought it was sensational. I thought I thought Colin Farrell stole the movie as Bullseye. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, was, he was perfect for that role. He was born to play Bullseye. Um, I thought Ben Affleck was really strong as Daredevil. Uh, I liked him so much more as Daredevil than I did as Batman. I like him um, as Batman. Uh, I, I, the one movie I was disappointed in, I tell you, the movie I was disappointed in was Elektra. Oh, uh, Elektra. Oh, uh, Electra. Electra. Oh, yeah, boy, I was so disappointing. Yeah, I just, that thing. I mean, uh, I don't. I I really truly don't know what happened. Um, yeah, they 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 played that like it's the end of the world. They didn't let Jennifer Garner smile at all. And it's just like, wow. And any, anybody that makes a movie with Jennifer Garner doesn't let her smile. I know. Yeah, retire already. Uh, Dan says he loved his follows. Me too. Uh, Eric says, fuck Miss Samar. <laughs> Eric, Eric's going to be my new best friend. I'm telling you now. <laughs> I, he's my new best friend. 
Uh, he says Florence Pugh is great, but he didn't like that movie. Uh, he actually saw the lighthouse in theaters and he liked it, but I don't know after seeing the witch, I think it went down. Uh, I think, it, I think I went down on it and the director, um, I actually liked the witch. I thought it was okay. Me. I actually watched that with Casey. Uh, I, I liked it. I liked it. All right. Um, but yeah, same. I remember when you got excited for the green Knight. you were hyped. You were hyped for the Green Knight. In yeah, fact, man. you actually spurred my interest for it. And I watched you talk about it before it came out. But after it came out, I never heard you talk about it. No, because <laughs> it's it's not a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that because I said I'm gonna I'm excited to see that. John's excited about it. I'm gonna go check that out. And then uh, then after it came out, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> not not a good movie. <laughs> That's a shame because I like Dev Patel. Yes, uh, Casey saying Electro was awful. Yeah, it was. Um, and then uh, uh, Eric says that Ben Affleck was better as Batman. No, no, he was so much better as Daredevil. He was awesome, Daredevil. Oh, I like him as Batman. <sighs> oh, uh, see, uh, Mother did not lose money. It was a fifty million dollars gross worldwide. Yeah, they made it for well. How much they made, did they make you know, it for? And they made it for thirty, and they got fifty back. But isn't it the return? Like, don't you have to make like three, three times the production budget for it that's, to be a profitable movie? Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's the general rule. I think it's like three times. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Eric saying that uh, the, the Green Knight is decent. All right, all right. Uh, Dan likes him as Batman as well. And Betty's Betty saying she loves Ghost uh, Ghost Rider. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not like I didn't like Ghost Rider. I really do. I think Ghost Rider is fun, but I, I just, I just love Daredevil. Daredevil was was really kick ass, um, which made Electra so so disappointing. Yeah. Um, that that uh, so it's when you guys get together. How did you guys meet at the Cinema Squad, and what was it like meeting each other face to face? Meeting each other face to face was surreal. Man, that was that was a crazy time. We had uh, almost a week together. We rented out an Airbnb, and it, we didn't miss a beat. We missed no beats. It was like we were talking on the live streams. The only difference is we were just getting used to how we actually look like, how tall we actually are. But aside from those things, no, it, we missed no beats, no difference. We just we went right into our our regular interactions and relationship. I, I, you know, you could definitely see the chemistry with you guys. Um, it definitely could. I mean, watching you guys do the review of uh, don't worry, darling. Oh my gosh. It was seamless. I was like, wow, these guys, it, it looked like you guys been doing it for like 20 years. I appreciate that, man. And it seemed the same way to us. Seamless is a, is a great word to explain it. It was seamless. Um, so I, uh, I, uh, who, whose idea was it to put it to, to to meet down in Florida? Was it uh because that's where you live at? Was it your yeah. idea for everybody to come down? My idea was to meet up. I would I never want anybody to feel uncomfortable if they don't have the finances to come to Florida. I was willing to go out myself if we were going to have a couple days together. I was willing to go out to Nebraska if that's where we decided to go to. But they they decided Florida would be better because there's a lot to do in Florida. So I said, hey, that's fine with me. I was just looking out for you guys because I know you got to pay airfare and, and the Airbnb. And so I was just looking out for your finances. But if you're OK with it, I, I'm definitely OK with it because I'm close to home. Let's do it. But the idea of meeting up was uh, was my idea. But then uh, the upside Dan, Dan came along and we would talk about Halloween Horror Nights at uh, Universal Studios here in Orlando because they had a black phone haunted house. And we wanted to do uh, the black phone haunted house. And so that's where we started to plan the trip. And then we did it. We finally did it. We finally saw each other. We got here. We went to Universal Halloween Horror Nights, and we finally did the Black Phone House all together. <laughs> I think it's so cool. Now, is this the first time you ever met anybody online like that from like YouTube or Facebook or whatnot? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I would say so. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So fun. So fun. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Casey wants to know where in Florida, uh, Spookala. 
Have you ever been to Spookala? The, the convention? Spokala? Is it Spo yeah. Spo Spookala or Spokala? Spookala. I think it's called maybe I think it's called Spookala, maybe. Oh no, no. I, I know Ocala. Ocala is a city in Florida, so maybe they do an event there called Spookala. Yeah, they must that's what it must be. Yeah, but I'm Orlando. I, I'm I'm Orlando. Uh, so what was that one of the calling cards? You know, come on down to Florida. We'll do you will do you we'll do Universal Studios, we'll do uh the beach, uh you know, uh, we'll we'll do a little hurricane hunting. <laughs> no, they live right before the hurricane. So I got the hurricane, they got all the good stuff. They got all the sunny days, I got the really bad flood days. We we went to Universal one day and then we spent the other days kind of hanging out. We would go to restaurants, we went to see a couple movies together. Uh, we met other YouTubers. We met uh, Anthony Perez. We met D Movie Man. Um, okay. I know, and, I know. Yeah. So, and we, you know, hung up by the pool and we recorded our review for Don't Worry Darling. We recorded a skit all together that should be coming along soon. Uh, what, what do you, uh, I mean, how, how did you guys meet? Uh, do you remember how you guys met uh, before you got met in person? Do you remember how, you know, how the Cinema Squad met? Because I always I ask this of uh, Sean and, and Dan, but I, I want to hear your perspective about it. How did you uh, How did you end up meeting each other online? I think Sean was the first one I met, and it's because he commented on one of my videos. I don't remember which videos, but he he commented on one of my videos, and then he would regularly comment on my videos. And I thought, okay, well, this guy's watching my videos, and he's regularly commenting. I'm going to do the same for him. So I would do the same for him, and we would go back and forth. And eventually, we followed each other on Instagram. And every now and then, if I had a recommendation, like, Sean, have you seen this documentary? Have you seen this true crime docuseries? You should check it out. And he would do the same for me. Uh, and it was kind of just a small talk here and there every couple of days, maybe I'll write him. He'll write me. And eventually Sean was like, Hey, uh, I had this idea of like maybe making a group with like-minded individuals with very different opinions, but still get along. And I said, dude, like, that's awesome. I'm totally on board for something like that. And he's like, cool. So we're like, who are we thinking? And we kind of listed some people and those people are now in the group. That's so cool. Uh, your collective is really cool. I mean, I, I like the way you guys cover everything, and you don't cater, you don't pander to the masses. Oh, uh, no. which, is, I, which is why I really, I really respect that. Yeah, f the masses. Because uh, there's there's some uh, there's a lot of groups out there that do that, and it's like you you sort of feel sorry for them that they're doing that. And it's like you're pandering to it, but you're but you but you're more creative than that, and and people know that you are, but yet you'll 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 pander to the common denominator. Mm -hmm. And I just feels when you do that, I just think that it takes away, it takes away your voice, you know, because you're not really being able to really exercise movies, how you, you know, some of the movies you want to talk about, you really can't do that because you're too busy making sure that your, your following is hearing about the movies they want to hear. Yeah, and man, exactly. Like, I mean, your channel is for you to express. It's not yeah. for, it's not to be hijacked, right? A hundred percent. 100 percent and either you're with us or you're not and that's cool um so how does it feel being a, a, a newlywed and a, and, a, and a new father man being a father that's that's one of the best things to have ever happened to me i love it i love it i love it i love being a father uh i've been married to my wife in november it's gonna be three years now in november wow yeah, but yeah, being like that's been a journey in itself, uh, refreshing and enjoyable. And being a father was something I, I just wow, wow. One of, that's that's been amazing, Patrick. That's been one of my highlights of my entire life. And I, every single moment I have with my family is is my favorite thing. You 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 sometimes hear a lot of people, whether it's it's comedically or not. Uh, they like to downplay marriage or downplay parenthood, whether it's for jokes or not. But I can't even joke about it, Patrick. I I, I love it so much. No, no, I, I I agree. I mean, it's the best thing that happened to me too, you know. Um, and you know, and you you love them to uh, you know, you know, for for better or for worse, you know, and you know, you know, through sickness and health. I mean, it's just you know, and you and you have to. You know, you have to really believe those words and live those words. 
And, um, you know, cause your kid's watching you too, you know, You're, she's watching you guys. She's seen, she's seen how you interact with each other. And, um, I, it, were you nervous, were you nervous bringing a, you know, I mean, this is sort of, maybe this is a little too personal, but I'm just curious and you know me, I'll ask anyway, yeah. but were you, were you a little nervous of, uh, of bringing your, uh, bringing a baby into this world? Oh yeah. You, yeah. I would, I would mm -hmm. think I, I, I just, I just ask, I just want to ask parents like that, that question every time I see him, it's like, are you, are you scared? I mean, here we are, who would ever think that here we are in 2022 and the specter of nuclear war sitting over our shoulder. When we yeah. thought, we thought we got rid of that 40 years ago mm -hmm. and yet here we are now. And it really feels, it really feels closer. I feel closer to it now than I did back in the eighties and the eighties was a horrible time. Oh wow! I mean, it was really bad. It was really bad. Oh wow! Uh, and um, but now it feels really, it's sketchy. You know, uh, is that is that a, is that a concern for you? I mean, do you think about that a little bit, or you just say, you know what, whatever happens, happens? I, it's a little of both. I I do think about it. I think any parent in their right mind, it they should think about these things just so, to know how you should go about your parenting and the things that you should explain to your child what they may or may not be seeing in the world when they're not around you, whether that's in school or if they're hanging out with their friends outside of your specific supervision. And what do I need to get them ready for? And I bet what I'm going to have to get my daughter ready for to today in 2022 is a lot different than what parents in the eighties had to get their children ready for. Yeah. Uh, when your daughter was born, uh, what was the, what was, the, what were some of the fun part? What was the fun part about the first year of her being born? What was the one thing she did that always just made you laugh? Um, my, my daughter is still so young. She's, she just turned five months uh, okay. last week. Yeah. So she still hasn't come. Oh, is she crawling yet? No, not yet, not yet. But uh, she's sitting. She's she's sitting, and she's man. It's such a hard question, Patrick. It's it's every day. There's something that I just love every just single day. Wait, I know it's that's the best. It got really a baby is. proof. Baby proof. It, it, it is. It's actually the the highlight. Uh, I, I, my two younger brothers, when my mom had them, and I sit there and we watch them crawl. You know, that was the best part. They, they sometimes they would crawl, and then they roll over on their back. They roll over like two, three times. Like, it was funny as hell. Uh, I think that's the best part. I think that's the best part about babies is when they crawl. Yeah. Somewhere, somewhere, when they first stand up and take that first step, everybody says, "Oh my gosh, you're taking the first step." I always feel like, well, it was fun while it lasted. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited to see what's next. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Yvette is saying, uh, maybe I should say hi to you when I fly to Orlando next month. Wow, that would be really cool. Uh, uh, actress Yvette Willett, who I uh, interviewed uh, I interviewed last night. And um, wow, that would be cool. You will really enjoy her. She yeah, is such a yeah. she's, she's awesome. Awesome. Do, do you have you have you ever interviewed anybody? I know Sean no. does interviews. Have you ever interviewed anybody for the Cinema Squad? No, I've never interviewed anybody. I I I don't know how I would react to somebody that's expecting to be interviewed. I do love to host. If you've seen our streams, you know I'm I'm usually the main host, trying to get that sh that ball moving and and the show flowing. But when it comes to just one person expecting to be interviewed. I don't know how I would react under that type of pressure. Uh, I, you know what? Let me help you. Um, I think there's a lot of, I think actually, I think YouTube has created a, a lot of natural talkers. Um, and all interviewing is, it's just like, this is, does this feel like an interview for you? Or does it feel like we're just sitting here having coffee? Well, I am, I'm quite literally uh, having coffee. So yeah. Well, there you go. And that's really what it's about. Yeah. It's, really, it's really all it is. It's okay. just, sit, just sitting there talking, talking. It'd be like uh, just talking to me, just having a coffee, just talking to me. It's, uh, it's very relaxing, actually. And I think I think celebrities, whatever list, A list, B list, C list, celebrities, whatever you want to say, I think that's what they want to is just to have conversations with people. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not I'm not someone who gets starstruck, believe it or not. I it could be the biggest celebrity ever. I don't get starstruck. I, I've always kind of taught myself that they're just people like me that had opportunities that 
I haven't gotten and they put their pants on one leg at a time and they yeah. get sick like I get sick and they just happen to have cameras on top of them and and that's it. But for example, I, I've seen celebrities in public and while everybody else is, oh, whoa, it's this guy, it's that, I, I don't care. Like I'd rather just ask, ask that person, hey man, what's up, how's, how's your day been? I'd rather ask them that than like, let's take a selfie. I, I'm not that type of person. No, 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 I, yeah, I, I don't get starstruck. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll admire somebody. Yeah. Or, all right, maybe I did get our starstruck when I introduced uh, when I uh, interviewed Tristan Risk, but you can forgive me for that. Um, <laughs> okay, it happens. It happens. It um, does. But no, but I love. I just love talking to him. Uh, I love just talking because um, I noticed Sean. Sean did some interviews, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought he did outstanding. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you guys do you guys talk about each other's technique when you guys talk? I mean, do you ever like give anybody advice, or do you ever ask anybody advice from the squad? Um, sometimes, sometimes we, we don't that much only cause no one's asking. So nobody's really telling, but we do have those conversations sometimes. And, and I think they're very fruitful to have. I think const constructive criticism is important. You can't just say like my, my friend is the best at everything. Unfortunately, that's, that's not true. Your friend isn't good at everything. There's always something they could get better at. Yeah. Do you, what do you, what do you, what's one part of your game that you would that you would like to improve? Me, I would just love to, to not to stutter. Not to stutter? Oh my gosh! <laughs> uh, if I could do if I could do that, I I'd be happy. Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. At this point, it would be more consistency with my own product because I I'm focusing so much on my family that I my YouTube career has been so solely regulated to just the cinema squad. So I'd, I'd love to just get back to my own stuff and, and figure out what I need to work on. Cause I'm not a hundred percent sure. Well, I got, I got a list of IFC films I can send you away. If you want to, <laughs> if, you're, if, you're looking, if you're looking for films to review and talk about. You send them my way, Patrick, send them my way. <laughs> I got, I got, I, there's over a thousand of them out there. So I mean, no, 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 uh, there's no no lack of movies. Uh, send me um, ten, ten of them. I, I you know I, I noticed that nobody said yes when I asked to show my stack off. So I, there you go. Thank you guys. Um, I thought I thought we said yeah, show us your eight twenty fours. Like no one said that, so I was happy. Um, let's see. Uh, Drew sitting there going um, uh, between Stallone and Schwarzenegger. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, which let's see. Uh, which uh, let's see. Uh, who, who, who are what fan are you of? Uh, of, of Stallone or or Schwarzenegger? Uh, which which fan? Uh, let me see. Let me get this right. Which fan are you of? Stallone or Schwarzenegger? Which one do you like better? I think Schwarzenegger has made so many more successful movies than Stallone. Maybe even more watchable movies than Stallone. But Stallone still has Rocky, and I love Rocky. Rocky is right. one of my favorite franchises. I would choose Stallone only because I could just rewatch that Rocky franchise for the rest of my life. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. At least for the first three movies, you gotta throw in Rambo too. Oh yeah, come on, come the on. Three, the first three Rambo movies were awesome. Absolutely. I don't, know, I don't know so much after that, but I definitely know of the first three. Um, yeah. have have you noticed this the, when you guys talk about performances? Have you isn't do you find ever uh, do you ever like look at certain actors the way they act and like you mentioned um watching Hunger Games uh, catching uh, uh catching fire? I'm mm. sure you went back to watch it. Um, are there what actors today are you fans of? Do you guys you know like what are your who's your favorite director or who's your favorite actress or actor? Um, favorite director is Quentin Tarantino. I've been a fan of Quentin Tarantino since I was in middle school. Uh, I I love Quentin Tarantino. Lately, though, I've been hearing a lot of opinions on Quentin Tarantino. I never even knew existed. People that don't really like his style, and I kind of I kind of get that. He can be abrasive. He can be abrasive, but but I, I do love Quentin Tarantino. Uh, act actor wise, love Tom Hanks. My whole yeah. life, I've loved Tom Hanks, and you can never go wrong with a Leonardo DiCaprio or Daniel Day Lewis. 
Yeah. <laughs> I left actress for last because my favorite actress, Patrick, is Frances McDormand. No, it's not. It is. Is it really? I love Frances McDormand. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Hey, but I, I do agree. I, I do agree. She did not deserve to win for Nomadland. I agree. Yeah, I, I just I just felt like I had seen a lot more better performances. But at least she didn't say Tony Collette. I mean, you didn't sit there and say, yeah, Tony Collette should have won. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just... <laughs> I love Tony Collette and Hereditary, Patrick. That's why, that's, why, that's why Hereditary was so disappointing for me was because I love Gabriel Byrne and I love Tony Collette. And they were just like underused and Al Pacino. I, she was she, Al Pacino had possessed a Tony Collette in Hereditary. <laughs> she was so over the top. It's just like, oh Lord, have mercy. Um, what movies? Uh, what do you think's gonna? Who do you think's gonna win the Oscar this year? Ooh, for Best Picture. Yeah, if you had to pick a choice right now. Yeah, man, there's a, there's a, I think there's definitely a top three to be looking at right now with the awards race and where it's going. You have The Fablemans, which is Steven Spielberg's next, next film, uh, which is a, a fictionalized biopic of his own life, which I'm excited for. Don't know if you've seen the trailer. If you have it, I suggest you watch it. It's very charming, very magical. I, I, you know, that movie, um, I'm so glad, you know, I, I, there's one thing we talked about physical media before, and that's really what's really cool about theaters now. It's the fact that if it if it's if it comes out in a theater, it's going to get a home release, and I yeah. think that's really, I think that's really important. And uh, so, so every time I see a movie like that hit a theater, I know there's a chance that I can go out there and buy it and watch it. Uh, uh, and I agree with you. The Fablemans looks absolutely charming as hell. Yeah, yeah. So that that's one. The other one, I probably heard about it. Don't know if you've seen it, but it's getting a lot of talk. It's still my favorite movie of the year. It's everything, everywhere, all at once. It's getting a lot of Oscar buzz even now. I think it's deserved. Deserved. It's still my favorite movie of the year. And I think it's going to make it to at least a nomination. And if it gets enough hype rolling, still rolling by Oscar night, it could take Best Picture. Yeah, I want to see that movie. I won't lie to you about that. I really want to see that. I... I keep hoping that 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 my library will drop it off, so I can pick it up a copy. Uh, your so, yeah, your library, I, I, yeah, I, I uh, yeah, it's shit, movies are expensive. Uh, no, no, but that's great. Like your library has great movies. My library just we just got in Roman Holiday. It's like what? That's your newest film, Roman Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we we have a, a in our book in our our library, they have it built within. They have a bookstore, Secondhand oh. Pro. And so uh, every Tuesday I do a, a, a library hall day. I go down there and before I was buying movies for a dollar. But now now, now because of lack of sales, they've actually dropped the prices down to a quarter. So everything, pretty much everything wow. I get for a movie, I get for a quarter. And every TV season I get is a dollar. Ooh, it's great though. Yeah. So, uh, but the thing is, though, it's like I have to depend on donations. You know, they have to do they have to drop the movies into the bookstore, otherwise, you know, because I can't get them brand new. It's just too expensive for me. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, e what's that? What's that? I think oh, everything, oh, okay. Uh, all dancing, at once. Dan yeah, Dan saying the same thing. It's his favorite movie of the year too. Um, yep, and Casey saying it. Uh, but we haven't seen Guy Gan Rex yet, though. Uh, uh, Casey, that could be the best film of the year. I'm holding out my, I'm holding back my opinion until I see Guy Gan Rex. Uh, uh, Eric saying, uh, uh, every, every, everything everywhere is okay, but hella overrated. So watch out, Patrick. <laughs> I do believe there's somebody out there with a little bit more spice against A24 than even me. Yeah, That's but I mean, you 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 got to take Eric with a grain of salt. He gives every single episode of House of the Dragon five stars. Uh yeah. Well, that's another. That's a whole uh, uh, Game of Thrones. That's uh that's interesting. Um, the and the Rings of Power though. Uh, the the young lady who plays uh, Gladriel. Mm, mm -hmm. Um, she did. She she was the leading actress of Saint Maud. 
Yes, yeah, she was. She was. Uh, have you I, seen Have you seen Rings of Power, Patrick? No, I, I no, I saw Saint Maud, uh, which I I did like. I liked that very much. Uh, okay. It's not a horror. It's not a horror film though. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's definitely a, a it's it's a really good movie. Real good. Um, let's see, House of the Dragon is five stars every week. Uh, yeah. Oh, have, have okay. you? Have, yeah, uh, you haven't watched Games of Thrones yet, or uh, uh, there's a lot of pressure on uh, Hollywood. I mean, you have to you have to move or get removed. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't, if you, I mean, I think they've already lost the showrunners to to uh, Game of Game of uh, 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 the Rings of Power. I hear they already lost their showrunners. Oh my God! Well, already, I mean, already that, placed them. That that first season, the first season of Rings of Power, it it, uh, it ends next week. And I, I am not impressed with Rings of Power. I was at first. I thought it was, whoa, I can't wait. I can't wait to see where this is going. And then I found out that the season finale is next week. And I said, wait, what? I The story just started. Wow. Yeah. It's, it was, but, it's disappointing. Uh, listen, I could keep you here for another two hours, but I'm not going to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to wrap this up. Absolutely. Uh, I definitely, I definitely, well, you, you have to come back. We're going to, we're going to do another cinema squad takeover in 2023. Rest That's assured fair. upon that. Um, but I do want to thank the chat for coming out and supporting this interview. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't keep up the best I could. I'm, I am sorry. You guys had left a lot of comments. I will address them all when the, when the, when the comment sections post uh, on the, on the, on the show, and I will go back and I'll answer all your questions in the chat. Uh, uh, on, in the comment section, um, yeah, I'm sorry I neglected that. I was trying to keep up, uh, and but you know how it goes. Uh, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming out and sharing the, your point of view with us. I really do appreciate it. Um, it's been a real honor to inter you know to interview each of the Cinema Squad. I still got I still got Joe to go. Uh, I'll see about getting him on pretty soon, uh, and then. Uh, yeah, I, I we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you guys around. I know you guys got a YouTube channel, ded uh, solely dedicated to the Cinema Squad, uh, and then you guys are doing your own thing uh, on your own different channels. Uh, you know, uh, you know. I know Jace is uh, doing She Hulk, and um, and and, and uh, I know Sean's doing. You guys are getting ready to, for Oscar? You're getting ready for award season right now. Yes, we uh, are. Yeah, it's gonna be. Are you gonna do the rubber duckies again? Well, yeah, yeah, that's gonna be an Oscar thing. So get ready for that. Uh, when can when can we look forward to seeing that? The end of November. Uh, when it comes to the rubber duckies, definitely expect it around January to February. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, that's now when they're announced. That's right. Yeah, you don't do it until they're announced. Um, so uh, yeah, I I want to thank you again for coming out and and hanging out with us, and uh, I'll let everybody know that Sunday, Sunday, uh. uh on the 16th of October, uh, we will be wrapping up John Wick 3 and Anthony from Fever Dreamland Theater. He will be our uh, one of our guest co-hosts for that show. And he, too, is a member of the Cinema Squad. And uh, I had a poll up, st uh, up there. I, 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 asked, uh, I asked a poll. I said, uh, I said, who wins, the Avengers or the Cinema Squad? You guys were kicking ass at first, uh, but 29 votes later and the Avengers would win. Sorry, oh, well, we need some superpowers then. <laughs> but he did pretty good. He, got, he still got thirty-eight percent of the vote. That's not that's, bad. That's great, Patrick. Uh, but if I can, uh, if I can say um, thank you, thank you so much for having me on. This has been a pleasure. I I enjoy these eight questions with that that you do every week. They are um, a delight to to watch. Uh, you 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 do such a great job with your questions and with just the way the the show flows and, and the way you're able to expand on on a, on a person's personality and their interests i think you do such a great job and i was so excited uh when you invited me on I, i'm happy to to come back whenever you can whenever i can and and just know it but we want you on our shooting the shit show so so you keep a lookout for that that's coming i appreciate sure. you man thank you for this Oh, thank you so much. Uh, everybody else, we will see you at 10 o'clock, uh, which is getting to be pretty soon, over at Hobbs Horse Channel for uh, the Midnight Hour. As you well know, October is uh, the month of Spooktacular. Uh, that's where you uh, answer some questions over at Hobbs Horror. Uh, if you throw a little boogie into your answers, you get two entries into his Wheel of Doom. 
Have you have you have you ever heard of the spectacular? Uh, yes, I have actually, but no, I, I haven't I've got kept up with it and, and not the what it's actually about. The, the squad's got to enter. You guys all got to enter. I'm gonna I'm gonna post I'm gonna post his uh, his link down on everybody's channel uh, yeah. or on your Instagram. You guys all got to enter the spectacular. Please. Uh, uh, the midnight uh, the midnight hour will be taking place at about 10 10 15. That's where you'll see me and the cheetah. But if not, I will see you Sunday uh, on the Midnight Society with John Grande from Grande's Graveyard, and we are talking hidden gems. We will see you there. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, and have a great night. Stay safe. Stay right where you're at, John. Ta-da.